Hey, we're here at the SMX conference today going on an incredibly awesome search engine adventure. I've got Bill, Bill S. Preston, Esquire, and Ted Theodore Logan. <laughs> Both of them have been spending some time out at Google. Google and Bing. Bing. Yeah. We spent like two weeks there, so now we're like SEO experts. Yeah, I thought it was going to be bogus, but it was righteous. Woo! And the session's going to be all about... Oh, I'm going to talk about stuff that's bogus that you shouldn't do, and then I'll turn it over to Ted. Yeah, and I'm going to talk about the stuff you should do, man. Like, really. <laughs> awesome. So, it should be a good on. session. Party on, dudes! Party, Party on! on. Dudes. Woo! Thanks, Rufus. <laughs> I was actually told to arrive in costume, so uh, I dressed up like Matt Cutts because, like, I don't know if you guys have heard of our band. It's called the Wild Stallions, right? Yeah, we got a big battle of the band coming up, right? And we want to do really well, and we figured if we knew something about SEO, that might help us in our competition, right? So. You know, Rufus over here teleported us to Google and Bing for like two weeks. So we're like SEO experts now. Yeah. So we wanted to tell you a little bit about what to do and what not to do with search. I'm going to take the stuff that's bogus, right? Okay, so I'm going to Sandy Moss High School Football Rules Class 88. Okay, okay, so like I'm going to show you the bogus stuff. Um, See, I think I learned how to do a pretty good Matt Cutts imitation, so let me try that on for size. <clears throat> okay, all right. Hey, everybody. How's it going? I'm here to tell you a little bit about stuff that's bogus. Uh, first off, if I could have your cooperation, for this first little bit of examples, I prefer not to blog or tweet or take pictures or Pinterest first couple examples just because uh, I don't want to get a particular company mad at me. So if it's okay with you guys, <laughs> let's just not, you can tweet about being in the room, just don't tweet about this specifically for, for just like a few slides. Bill, what? Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. Okay, so I don't know if you guys have seen, but less than two weeks ago we launched a new website called How Search Works. It's really, really useful if you want to understand the mechanics of how Google crawls and indexes and ranks the way. <coughs> One of my favorite features is called the Live Spam Slideshow or the Spam Carousel. And what it does is it actually shows you spam as we are throwing it out of Google's index. It's, it's like watching over our shoulder as we're fighting spam. And so you can see all the kind of stuff that we're throwing out. So for example, if you look at this, you will quickly become very disillusioned and jaded, much as I am in risk of becoming after a few years. So this is a, a standard blog spammer who uses the domain name Best Online Casino Bonus Live Blackjack UK Casinos Roulette Slots UK. Right? This is why when somebody talks about, well, what if I have a page in two different languages and the prices are the same? I'm like, you're probably okay. Is your website Best Online Casino Bonus Live Blackjack UK Casinos Roulette Slots? So, no? Okay, you're probably fine. Okay, doorway pages. Doorway pages, you probably, you probably know this, but that's when you have a lot of different pages all generated to try to target a unique phrase. And so you end up with cookie cutter kind of stuff that's basically duplicate except for a very small amount of the phrases. So for example, this is a Shebang Machinery site. Uh, unfortunately, their doorways got some noise in it, and so now they have a page about crushing rabbits. If you read through, they say, we have excellent research and development group to provide our clients crushing rabbits. <laughs> so a little bit of a human eye can make a really big difference in terms of the quality of the pages that you create on your site. Speaking of auto-generated content, here's a quick example, Addict Explained. They said, with all the news about addiction and rehab, many people have questions, blah, 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 blah. And then they get down to some featured answers, which clearly no one has ever looked at, because the answer at the bottom is, when I dip, you dip, we dip. <laughs> yes, that's right. I put my hands upon your hips, and when I dip, you dip, we dip. And it, so it's a, it's a post about Freak Nasty and his 1997 song. Clearly no human has looked at that, right? Because a real person would not put <coughs> that on the page. 
for an addiction, very serious cigarettes, alcohol, when I dip, you dip, we dip, kind of thing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> finally, uh, well not finally, but another thing to bear in mind is auto-generated content is bad. Auto-generated content that involves the web spam team is just dirt stupid, right? So. I see Miley in the audience. Here's a piece of auto-generated spam that actually used a Miley video. Uh, you know, here's one. I think I got more reports about this on Twitter than any other spam I've seen. This is buying, buying links and they're using a picture of me. So <laughs> if you're going to do Facebook ads about buying links, don't use a picture of me, right? It gets back to me, OK? <laughs> All right, keyword stuffing. I thought we'd go a little different than just English. You got, you know, English is too easy. How about Japanese, right? Now, my Japanese is a little rusty. I don't know how you guys are on your Japanese. But you can actually tell just from looking at the patterns that this is very repetitive. This is keyword stuffing. It's repeated at the same time. And if you look at it, you can sort of spot this sort of, oh, this symbol keeps coming up over and over and over again. And, and these words keep coming up over and over and over again. So keyword stuffing, just repeating the same stuff, definitely avoid that. Gibberish is kind of like keyword stuffing, but it tends to be, you know, words that make no sense whatsoever, especially if you've got a bad spammer. So this is uh, Smart Square Logan's Install Hospital. Uh, if you try to read the text, because it's a little difficult to read, it's uh, sleeping opiate stock said body he is not. The eldest of his told me with rites and ceremonies of an orgiastic license beyond all. Right? It's kind of like slam poetry, but it's really just a bad Markov chain model spam level stuff. Okay, I want to spend a few slides on hacking. I don't think anybody in this room would do such a thing, but you might have to worry about being a victim of it. So let me just talk a little bit about hacking. It's funny, there was, there was somebody in the SEO sphere a few years ago who was like, I haven't seen anything from the web spam team for a while. I'm not even sure they're really working on web spam anymore. And the fact is, we were locked in mortal combat with hackers back then. In fact, 90% of the stuff that we throw out on the manual side is black hat spam. But one of the biggest categories after that is hacking. And it's, a, it's something that people don't realize that we're engaged in, but we really do have to pay a lot of attention to. So Tristram Stewart Waste is a real website dedicated to reducing waste. But they've been hacked, and so now they sell jewelry. And that's the sort of thing that happens all the time. Um, I want to drill in that anybody can have hacking happen to them. So anybody want to place bets on which large band from the 90s this page was on? Fish. Wild Stallions. Fish, Wild Stallions, no. Although, bonus points, right on. <laughs> any, any other guesses? There is a small prize if somebody gets it right. Yeah. Aerosmith, good guess, no. <laughs> wow, some great musical taste here. A lot of variety. Any other guesses? No, it's not Justin. Justin Bieber would not die every night. Okay. <laughs> we'll have to wait and get a good question to, to get the reward out. Okay, so this was Smashing Pumpkins, right? Uh, so there are a lot of very large, Al Gore, Donald Trump, lots of big sites have had their site hacked. They, you know, there's nothing you can do about it other than keep your site patched, try to make sure you don't have the security holes, keep your software up to date. And if you don't do that, you'll end up selling Photoshop and not realize it. Um, and the problem is, once the hackers get into your system, it's kind of hard to get out. So for example, um, this is the, and, and I appreciate if you don't call these guys out by name. Uh, you know, I have no desire to embarrass anybody or put them on the Hall of Shame. Don't worry, it'll all make sense. I'm a professional. If you use that Fetch as Googlebot tool, this is what the page looks like right now. The cheap bill Viagra, price of, you know, overnight Viagra delivery, Cialis generic Viagra, all that sort of stuff. And again, this is something where Fetch as Googlebot is your friend. Because if Google's seen the hacked page, you can see the hacked page too by using Fetch as Googlebot in our free Google Webmaster tools. Uh, we're looking at other ways to try to provide really useful resources because once you are hacked, we don't have the time to maybe hold your hand and walk you through and show you exactly where it happened, but if we could provide some sort of resources where people could become more educated, figure out what to do next, I think that would be fantastic. So hopefully we'll make some progress in the field. Paid okay, links, I think most people know about that. I'll just throw up the obligatory Matt Facepalm meme. If somebody's going to charge you $5 and get you a 1,000 quality backlinks, you should be suspicious. Um, I think that's a pretty well-known one. And then I wanted to close with an example of blog comment spam. You know, you, you have to be thinking about, even if you hire an agency, what are they doing on your behalf? Because
because blog and comment spam really pollutes the web in all kinds of nasty ways. So for example, this is a blog post of, of an Italian speaker, and she, she blogged about something in particular, and, uh, and so a spammer showed up, this was a bot, and says, my brother recommended I might like this website. He was totally right. This post truly made my day. You can't imagine how, how much time I spent looking for this info. And this is a new blogger, and she's not a native English speaker, and so she said, great, thank you for the compliment. I'm so happy my posts are interesting. I want to get your opinions on the topics. And so this was sent to me by a member of the web spam team. They said, I, I laughed for a while, and then I cried for a while, because these are site owners who are being taken in. And, and by the way, it does get worse. So cheap beats by Dre leaves a comment, Christmas beats by Dre. And then the admin shows up again, yeah, thanks for the compliments, I'm happy you like them. What's your name? What are you interested in? She's trying to talk to a bot, and it's just really sad. And finally, there's somebody who's like, and you know, you've seen these templates where it's like trying to sound real, and so the last comment is, thank you. I've recently been searching for information about this topic for ages. Yours is the best I've discovered till now, but what about the bottom line? Are you sure about the source? Again, complete bot. And at some point, the admin is like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> What's going on here? And it's it's just sad to see a human not solving the captcha and trying to engage with a bot. So whatever you can do to make sure that none of the agencies or people in-house or external do blog or comment spam on your behalf, you'll save people like this a little bit of a headache. Okay, so wrapping up, we want to have time for um, for questions. That's all bogus stuff to do. There's plenty of stuff, plenty of resources to learn how to do it right. We just launched this website, How Search Works. We've got the Webmaster Blog, Webmaster Forums that has Googlers and Power users, Webmaster Videos, I've made a lot of those, free Webmaster Tools information, Webmaster Academy for beginner guys, the SEO Starter Guide, also for more of a beginner audience. We have John Mueller and a whole bunch of other people who actually have Webmaster Hangout office hours in both English and German and other languages, and so you can look around for that. We've got lots of HTML documentation. But if I had to boil it down to like one thing, I guess what I'd say is like, make great sites that people want to go to, like like with our band, Wild Stallions. You know, we're like, we should make a good video. And then I'm like, no man, we gotta learn how to play. Let's get Eddie Van Halen and learn how to play first, and then people want to hear our band, right? So if you make great content, just be excellent to each other. It'll work out fine, but also be excellent to search engines because if you work out well and have good content, then we can help users find what they're looking for. All right, awesome. This has been Bodacious. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Or I mean, Bill. It sounds like you had an excellent experience at Google. Ted, I was wondering if you would share your experience telling me what's on the desktop. Well, could, you, could, could you tell me what it was like on your trip to me? It was a pretty excellent search engine. It was righteous. Yeah. Wild Stallions. Wild Stallions. guys on a, a most excellent adventure through some of the stuff that you should do, all right? Um, I, I am going to start this off, though, with a, a small anecdotal story that our spam team had shared with me. Um, we had a, a company uh, way early in this calendar year, I guess late last year, uh, was doing a lot of public complaining that uh, Bing was blocking them and, and that kind of idea. And um, we didn't really pay a lot of attention to it because you know you get a lot of people kind of dissing you out there and just saying negative things, and you really don't put a lot of resources behind chasing down every single thing that hits the net. We don't, at least. Uh, but the reality is, this one was persistent, and they kept complaining, and they actually got a news story in the country they were located in, and so we kind of looked at it and we said, well, you know, at the very least, we should take a quick look and make sure that we, in fact, are not doing anything on our end. Turns out we were blocking them because the domain that they used had been used prior to them by spammers and pirates to distribute malware. So, make sure you know the history of a domain. It really makes a difference. Now, they've gone ahead and cleaned everything up. Obviously, it's not a problem for them. We've re-included them. Everybody's back to loving each other and being excellent. 
but there's a real challenge there for webmasters. That's part of the job of the webmaster, of the SEO, to understand what that history is. So when a company comes forward and says, we need a new domain, we're gonna to move to a new domain, what is it gonna be? That's when you spring into action and figure stuff out. Go to archive.org, take a look through that data, understand what the history is of that, because it can bite you. If you find a domain that looks like an excellent domain and it's cheap, that raises a flag. So make sure you, make sure you take a look at that stuff. All right, so you guys know who I am. Um, one of the things that I'm gonna suggest that you guys start thinking about, be excellent with this, move from queries to sessions. Start thinking about the holistic approach of how people are finding you, how they're consuming content, and what they're looking for. When you do that, you're in a position to actually create more and better useful content for them that's actually matching the experience they're trying to have when they're searching online. That is really important, because as SEOs, we tend to get hung up on keyword research, keyword research, keyword research, and it's great, but you have to expand to that next level and understand when somebody searches for dishwasher, there's a whole lot to that cycle that they're looking for. And if you can provide that for them, you are gonna be authoritative. You will be the resource that they go to, that they tell their friends about, that other people love, and I guarantee you this. Matt and I might not agree on everything, but if people love you, we want a piece of you. That's the nature of search engines. So build the good stuff and mark up your content. Help us discover it, help us understand what it actually is. Because really, when we take in that content, we kind of disassemble the page and all the components float around in the system and then as we know what the query is, we try to understand which pieces are going to be the best result. And if we understand everything that you have, things have been marked up, they're identified, we're really confident in what it is, when we bring that object forward, the page gets reassembled, it comes forward, bam, you rank well, you grab the traffic. Marking up helps us with that. Schema.org. Make sure you guys are preparing for mobile, right? I mean, there's something that happens, um, and I, this is a constant, every time I get questions about this, you know, the business that you're working in is focused on itself and its space, and you're looking around with a competitive view with your, your industry, basically. When we are looking at things, we're looking at the entirety of the internet all in one shot. So we're looking at these scenarios, and we're seeing the growth of mobile, and we're understanding that people are finding new ways to search, they're finding new ways to interact with content in ways that matter more to them because it's circumstantial. That is a real challenge. As a business, you need to be prepared for that. You need to start thinking about this stuff. You know, If you're having the conversations right now about HTML5 and rich snippets and all of these things, you need to move within the next 12 months from having the conversation to taking the action. And these things aren't the, the sexy, bright objects that suddenly when you place, <laughs> drive your ranking sky high and give you a ton of new traffic. They don't do that, but they do prepare you for the evolution that's coming for all of these new scenarios that the searchers are engaging in. And that's what we're focused on, is what the searcher's engaging in and how we deliver better results for them. All right, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Focus. All right. Search is evolving, obviously, and I kind of alluded to this, right? We've got this whole idea of, you know, there, there's the typical, if you're in this room, you understand the concept of searching in a little box and you get a set of results, you know? Um, but there are plenty of people out there who are doing searches on mobile devices, you guys included, where the search itself is actually a gesture. It's the tap on the screen. There's no verbalizing. There's no typing. You're using an app so it filters down. I mean, what you're looking at right here is actually embedded. It's native to my new Nokia phone. And this thing is awesome. I hold it up. It tells me whatever businesses are around me. I get to filter by tapping for I want to eat. And then it'll show me all the restaurants. It brings in ratings information. So great for a consumer, super easy. New paradigm for the search engine to understand, but more important, new paradigm for you businesses to understand, to make sure you know how you get your information to be surfacing in these new experiences. Very important that you guys focus in on that stuff. Avoid shortcuts. Avoid shortcuts, like syndicated content. Does anybody here syndicated content? I mean like using the content on their website in hopes that you will rank higher. Go ahead, you, you can put your hand up, it won't be embarrassing at all. Okay, yeah, uh, you know. <laughs> okay, maybe a little bit, but only for a little while. Uh, the reality is you gotta avoid that stuff. And what you guys are looking at right here is actually, everybody knows what a link farm is. This is an example of a like farm and how the visualization of it happens. So when we look at these things, 
we see patterns, we being the search engines, we see patterns really well. You know, it's like really easy to pick out patterns. So if we all agreed in here, Dwayne posts something and everybody likes it, that's great. It would kind of look like this bottom unnatural thing, right? Because we all agree we, it's a pattern that gets established and we just continue that same thing over time. And then all that value is deprecated, it goes away and, and we kind of ignore you. If you continue to grow that kind of pattern, it becomes a problem for you. A natural pattern is I tweet something, someone likes it, but the people that are following them aren't following me. One of them likes it and off it goes and it just continues off into the ether. It looks more like a lightning bolt. So don't be taking don't be taking those shortcuts. You know, Matt put up that great example of, you know, a thousand inbound links for six bucks. No, not gonna happen. I mean you'll get the links, right? But really, not worth it. And I've watched my credit card too. Do pay attention to the details, my brothers and sisters. You have to make sure that you've got the basics covered, right? Now, in one of my next slides, I'm going to kind of show you guys how everything sorts out in terms of which tactics you want to focus on and why you want to focus on them. But the reality is, when it comes to SEO, there's a lot of technical stuff that you're going to be able to do. Um, and just a couple of points for you guys, because I know folks want to keep this list and take photos and everything else. I'm going to post this on my slide share. Um, and I think uh, the SMX guys, they have it on the laptop, so hopefully it'll get distributed through that as well. Um, so you will have an opportunity to grab this stuff. Uh, but the reality is there are all kinds of technical things and you have to get this stuff done, but it's your baseline, right? Like SEO is no longer the pinnacle work that happens with a website, right? It's the baseline and you've got to be doing it. You've got to cover the bases and you've got to do it well. So this is how I suggest people focus when they're building up their website. Content is obviously number one, and I know you guys have been hearing us say content is king since you know the internet started. Well, the truth is it still is. If you think about it, that's what people are looking for when they go searching. I mean, search isn't something where you wake up on Saturday morning, you grab your coffee, you grab your Snuggie, and you sit on the sofa in front of your laptop and say, I think I'd like to spend two hours typing words into a little box on my screen and just seeing what randomly pops up. This is not you know, a fun thing. You go to search because you need, you need a question to answer, you have a problem you need solved, you have a task you need to complete. Well, that task might just be you know, laughing your ass off at a cat video, but it's still a task. You know? You'll notice there are no embarrassing dog videos on the internet. What does that tell you? Social, obviously hugely important for folks. This is all about engaging with your customer and your clientele and having them amplify and really say that you are the authority on the topic. That's the reality behind social. I mean, turning this stuff on doesn't immediately give you a boost in rankings, but like I said a few minutes ago, if people love you and there's a real gravity happening around your product, we come looking, we want to understand what's going on with that. Because our job is to provide the best results to a query. And when that happens, if you're suddenly the best things in sliced bread, then we're going to want to include you. We want to test that out with our searchers and see, are you truly the best result? And if you are, if all of those signals are telling you you are, then you're gonna rank well and drive the traffic. User experience, anybody here doing UX testing? Usability testing, right? Yeah, so next year, everyone else's hands need to go up too. It is critical to do usability testing because if you wanna wow the search engines, first you have to wow your visitors. You're gonna do that by building the site they think they want, not the one you think they want, right? Um, my team launched the new Bing Webmaster Tools last June. And prior to launching it, we thought we had, you know, kind of like groupings and labelings and, you know, the names on the buttons figured out. It was pretty straightforward. We were webmasters after all. And we went into some usability testing with actual webmasters. We brought in a few dozen of them from different businesses around the U.S. and said, try to do this work. And they were universally confused by what they were seeing. And so we took their feedback. We went back and redesigned things, brought in a new template for them and said, try to complete the work again. And we went from 5% of those people being able to complete the task assigned to them to 82% of them being able to complete that same task. That was eye-opening because I've been doing this almost 15 years. I thought I had a pretty good handle on how to label these buttons and how to group content together. Well, it turns out that my constituents said otherwise. So absolutely, user experience, huge. And if you nail those first three things, link building comes to you. You don't need to go find it. That's it. When I used to run the SEO program at MSN, because they let me do that while I was there for those two weeks, kind of you know embedding with the team, we did zero link building. I mean, could you imagine that phone call? You know, hey Eric, uh, my name is uh, Dwayne Forster. I run the SEO program at MSN. Um, you've got a great blog over there, and uh, we've got this awesome article over here that's kind of related to it. But 
would you consider putting a link from your blog post over to my article? Yeah, that'd be great. It's 10 grand. For what? Oh, for a month for the link. Oh, right. Like, there's no possible way. There's, there's no way to do that. And as you start to grow and become more of an authority, that's what's going to happen to you every time you reach out. So skip the link building. Let it happen naturally because your product is amazing. And then SEO, this is all that technical stuff that I talked about. It's gotta be on the list, it's highly important. You cannot skip this stuff. But you have to know what you're doing with it. All right, targeted optimization. Does anybody take a look, um, okay, I'm just gonna cop to this. Uh, anybody know who Matt Bailey is? Right, he wrote, uh, was it Internet Marketing an Hour a Day? Okay, yeah, you probably wanna read the book because it's got a really awesome idea in it. It's this idea of assigning value to every one of your URLs. And the reason you want to do that is because then when you take it all and put it into a spreadsheet and sort it by value, you now know what the most valuable areas of your website are by whatever your measure is. It could be email signups, it could be uh, dollars, it could be page views, whatever your value prop is, doesn't matter. But do this exercise because when you've got mid to large size websites and you're scratching your head saying, what do I work on and in what order, this will help you figure out where the high value areas of the site are to your business, and then you can focus in on those things. So it is an awesome way to walk into a meeting and impress your boss too, because nobody at the executive level likes people to come in with the kind of light and fluffy and say, you've just got to trust me, I'm an SEO. What they want is you to come in and talk to them in dollars and cents so that they understand as they drive the company where the investment is going. This type of reporting helps you do that. All right, encourage more sharing. You want people to be involved with your business. You want them to take that action, share information, to be a friend of yours, to like this stuff. You want all that. Create lists because people love them. Use hooks, ego, humor, contrarian, all of that kind of stuff is fantastic. If you don't know what hooks are, research them and be careful with them, all right? What we think is humorous, and I will assure you, we think today's panel is hilarious. Some of you, I'm looking at those of you much younger, maybe scratching your head saying, what the hell? <laughs> and yes, I do come from the state of legalized pot. No, I didn't bring any. <laughs> Just to be clear. Hooks, you gotta know how to use them. What they're really good for is segmenting your audience. You nail something, people really respond to it, and it's egotistical, you're, you're stroking someone's ego, you know what, that's actually really good. Now you know that a portion of your people are responsive to that. Participate in communities, just get out there and embed yourself in them, be a part of that world, right? Be that expert, talk to the, the actual owner of the community, offer to be a sponsor of the community, play by their rules, answer questions freely, build up that value so people know to turn to you, right? Share other people's information, people love that. Twitter, it's all about the retweet, go for it, right? And ask questions. I mean, not like the example of our somewhat deliriously inept, but sweet and, you know, learning webmaster that Matt had. I mean, you want to ask questions of real people, obviously. Social's awesome for that, right? Get out there and engage with those folks. Build efficiencies, you know? Uh, here's one that I actually use, right? I take trusted RSS feeds. So anybody here follow uh, Search Engine Land? Yeah, so I do, right? You know, why not? Seems the right thing to do. Uh, so I take those feeds and I put them in my Hootsuite account and then they get published out from there, right? So I guarantee you at some point during this presentation, I will have tweeted, there it is. The reality is I trust the sources that I put content for and I can still have great conversations with people when they contact me. But where the real value for me is, when I want to create a blog post and I want to create a list of things that I think people should pay attention to, I take those feeds, I put them into if this, then that, I translate from there over to Evernote, and then I can copy and paste that, a couple little edits in it, post to my blog. Now I've got a list of 10, 20, 60 articles that were published in the industry this week that you should be aware of. It's a great way to create some streamlined efficiencies to move toward getting more content. This is a very specific example, but the reality is you need to look for ways to do this across all the areas of your organization. If you look around, you will find great tools out there that will help you do it, whether it's data visualization, tracking, all kinds of different things. The Webmaster tools are fantastic for helping you uncover stuff. One thing that I don't talk about in here is the reality of understanding what your code looks like. 
right? And Matt mentioned this on uh, getting hacked, right? I actually have a WordPress site, and it's been hacked for about seven years now, and I've never updated it, I've never fixed it, because I want to see what their pattern looks like and how they update and that kind of idea. And I'll go in and remove that, that link list that's in there, um, and the reality is that, you know, a couple weeks later, it just comes back, they post it back again, and that's it. It doesn't do them any value, but they don't really care. That's their approach. Uh, but if you understand what your code looks like and you use the fetch as bot tools at both of the sets of webmaster tools You will be able to very quickly understand if something's been hacked when you look at that And that's something that I talk to bloggers and startups quite a bit about because they tend to be very separated from the code they, They're very creative. They want to create the content. They want to engage with the people They don't want to do the programming. They don't want to be inside the code base but they really have to understand if you took a photo of your code This is what it should look like. It's a bit of a piece of art and when somebody goes in there with a can of spray paint and puts a mustache on it, you should be able to see that there's a mustache on there. And the tools will help you do that. Now, this one's actually really important, and this is you guys, right? And it's investing in new skills for you. So as an SEO, you've got to be able to cover all this stuff that's up here. This is very important for you, right? Whether you're a small SEO, a large SEO, you're going to encounter this stuff. And this is all about influence. It's about getting the resources you need. It's about getting the work done that has to get done. And most SEOs think that their job is about uncovering the problem and then telling someone, here's the problem, go fix it. Right? The reality is, as an SEO or a webmaster, we are way past that expectation today. So you have to get in there, understand these skills. Uh, I am going to recommend you guys read a book called The Power of Habit. It is a fabulous book that really helps explain how human beings respond and do what they do and how you can change their habits and the way to go about doing it. It is a fantastic book. I think it was released late last year. Um, I got it, uh, read it on my Kindle in like a day and a half, and then ordered hard copy so I could read it and take notes and whatnot. It's, it's fantastic. And if you need me, I'm gonna go under the pseudonym of at Dwayne Forster on Twitter, so folks can reach out as they like. Um, other than that, be excellent dudes. that maybe in film communities might not be uh, working for a number of people in the audience. <laughs> That's okay, we get it. It's only five dollars to buy on Amazon, so you know you can even own it. It's well worth watching. And educational. Uh, all right, we are accepting transmissions. We use that uh, QA thing that's up there, then Michelle Robbins who's sitting back there wait will queue it up for me, and then I will look through it and decide whether or not it should be added. And that will save us a lot of time. All right. I don't know whether this takes care of or not. <laughs> I'm maybe segueing out. Hey, Matt. Some say the disavow tool is just some trick for Google to catch you since you're basically reporting yourself. No. Uh, duh, but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, um, any truth to that? So at the point, uh, can you guys hear me okay? They can't. Okay. Hence the lag reaction. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Can you hear him now? Louder still? Yeah. And this concludes the Verizon portion of our test. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so at the point where you're using the disavow tool, you, you already basically uh, are having issues. You know, Google is not counting your links, or you have some sort of algorithmic or manual issue. So, no, the point of the disavow tool was not to trip SEOs up into disavowing a bunch of links and then benefiting from that. There was a similar kind of misconception last year where people started to get the unnatural links warnings, and you'll you'll always see a few people on the Black Hat forums who are like, dude, it's a trap, don't do it, man. They don't think you have unnatural links, they just want to hear what you think are the unnatural links, man. And that wasn't at all the case. Uh, we were pulling apart different link networks. We're always doing that. Uh, we took a, a first initial step on a very large link network uh, just a week or two ago. Uh, we've got guys working on, uh, and, and women working on, another link network that we're going to pull down in the next you know, week or two. So, no, the disavow tool was not some sort of honeypot or something to try to get people to say these are bad links. It was so that people who, for whatever reason, are not able to get links down now have a way where they can disavow those links. You have a disavow tool also. Are you tricking people? 
<laughs> oh, totally, yeah. Um, no, well, we, we launched ours uh, right after the Webmaster Tools launch, and uh, before and because we were so successful at tricking everybody, you know, Matt said, hey, look, we, we need some of that too, right? So, you know, no, uh, really, the reality with that stuff is um, it's, it helps us understand what the intent of Webmaster is, and in a lot of cases, um, people will do things, and it's legacy, and then a new person comes in and says, oh, you know, we should be engaged in that, and it's an opportunity for them to kind of deal with that. In almost every single case that we see, uh, we've already dealt with things if there were a problem well before the webmaster showed up and said, yeah, I don't want those links. We looked at them and said, yeah, you don't want those links. And we just deprecate value on it, right? Um, it's, um, it, it has been interesting though, to hear from you know some of y'all and, uh, and watch it go kind of sideways. So, been entertaining. And let me just add a couple quick things about disavow. When we see people not using disavow that well, there tends to be two basic trends. One is they will disavow specific links when if it's a porn, spam site, just disavow the entire domain. Because you might have disavowed you know, three links, but there might have been five links from that domain. So if you're looking through the list and you're like, well, that is clearly a crap domain, you know, uh, go ahead and disavow the entire domain. The other thing is the format of the file, we thought we were like, oh, this will be so simple. It's a text file, one URL per line. You know, couldn't get any simpler, nothing but a text file. But people upload Excel files and doc, Word and you know CSV and all that sort of stuff. It's just a text file. So if you upload, if we, we can try to make the error messages better, but just remember one URL per line, normal straight text, not comma separated value, Excel, Word, any of that stuff. Because otherwise the parsing will fail. Yeah, we, we when we launched ours, um, it took uh, nine and a half hours for the first domain to come in and uh, disavow every one of their own URLs. And that we kind of, because of course we were asleep, you know, so we came in the next day and we were looking through the list and we were like, oh, well that's interesting, this guy really loaded it up with every one of his own URLs. And so then we had to go in and force the system to not allow you to do that. <laughs> you know, and when we emailed him about it to tell him, look, you're going to notice that we've changed this in your account, he was completely dumbfounded, he had no idea, he said, oh, yeah, my SEO just told me I should go in and disavow everything, so. I was like, oh, okay. When, when, they, when, when the Google rolled out the web app tools that it provided, it was somewhere in the issues that came up, like, oh, I don't want to use those because that's just people trying to trick me. And it's like, and we'll talk about this more in the last panel we have on the SEO conversation. But, you know, if you haven't gotten the point, the search engines are moving towards trusted a model. So, you know, the more that they can trust you, the more that they're likely to reward you. And so the people who are like, I don't want to use this thing because that's people trying to trick me, are the people who have something that they're probably trying to hide from Google or Bing. So you don't have anything to hide from Google and Bing, you don't have anything to fear from the tools. And in fact, they should help you continue to be well trusted. So, um, so what are the future plans to clean up the short-term loan SERPs? Is there something a state license lender can do to help? And let me broaden this out a bit too. It's like, you don't even want to search for payday loan, okay? Because like, when you rolled out Penguin or you rolled out, it doesn't matter. There's always some crappy sites that are showing up there. And I don't even know which are, that I can trust or whatnot. And that can go into any kind of competitive space as well. So can you actually succeed with this? And how do you, how do you actually figure out a way that for these really highly competitive things that it's just not whack-a-mole? Well, I mean, we're never going to give up trying to return the best sites. Uh, you want to think about that? Uh, so, so each algorithm will iterate and work on different kinds of sites, and then we see what's left over, what's the residual, and then we figure out either how to improve an existing algorithm or how do we write a new algorithm that should help with some new spam attack. And at the same time, the black hats and the spammers are always making new sorts of attacks. So, for example, in the space that you were talking about, uh, it's pretty common for people to use thousands and thousands of hack sites. And it's almost like a fire hose of links that they just point to churn and burn disposable sites. So we actually do have an engineer or two working on those sorts of high velocity stuff as well. Yeah, it's, um, it, it is a never ending scenario. Um, and it seems like every time, you know, we share something, we say, hey, don't do these things. You know, there are literally three other new things that we've never seen before that just appear. And um, quite entertaining, quite engaging but obviously quite problematic. Um, you know, uh, I talked a little bit about this idea of uh, prioritizing your website based on dollar figures, whatever it is. That's a form of filtering, and that's what we engage in when we look at this stuff, because obviously you can't go out every single thing, every single time. 
you have to find, have to find a way to scale that and filter and determine what's the most heinous versus you know what's slightly problematic, and then kind of dig in the um, you know I'll give you guys an idea here. I, I spent some time. Um, un unlike Matt, I don't sit on the spam team. I run my master tools, so I actually just went to the spam team and said, "Talk to me. Give me some stuff, right?" And um, you know, there's there's different levels to spam. There's different classified levels of it, you know, and some of it is pretty straightforward. Um, so you know, on the low end, you'll have things like junk, so useless but not malicious, part sub 404s, things like that. Uh, doesn't really make a big difference. Um, other things you'll have is keyword stuffing, right? I love the Chinese example because it was like a piece of art. It's like if you stare at it long enough, you'll see something. Um, you know, Make it your own like product. Um, and then you get into um, spam. That stuff is like, that's where the keyword, the keyword stuffing sits. And that's like malicious, but not particularly um, problematic, right? Even though the content could be useful, there's still a level of maliciousness to it. And then at the front end of things, you've got no right pirate. And that's the stuff that ultimately is problematic. That's where you start seeing malware warnings applied to websites, domains being blocked and serves, domains being pulled out completely, because there's a real problem. There's an error or there's an issue on the site which could hurt someone if we transmit them to that. That's obviously a high priority. We never want a consumer to be harmed by a result that we gave them. And it really is, it's, it's kind of an interesting area to be in simply because it's constantly evolving. And you thought SEO was constantly evolving. It's nothing like the spam world. Um, you talked about preparing for mobile and um, going into this stuff now as well. But how does Google and Bing, how did they, do they understand response to mobile design? What are the positives and negatives to it? Do you want to have a mobile site and a regular site? Do you just want one site that does it all? Do you just want one site that doesn't really do it all, but it's still just one site? Yeah, um, yes. So, um, so, so the reality with this is, um, you know, we do understand responsive design. Um, you know, so uh, to get like super granular on it, right? When you're using HTML5, you're going to have multiple H1s on there. And one of the things that I'm working on with my team is updating our actual SEO rules inside the SEO reporting that's available in the Webmaster Tools at Bing, because we need to change from multiple H1s are a problem to you have multiple H1s. The reality with that is in a responsive scenario, we simply look at the first one and say, okay, let's apply that toward the SEO for the website. Uh, and the rest of them just become design elements and we just keep on trucking on forward. So there's nothing you have to do, it's very straightforward. Again, it comes back to how consumers are consuming your content and how they want to consume the content. You know, when I'm on this thing, there's a very specific way I want content and there's a very specific reason I want the content. So I have to be a little more pedantic when I search, but I also have to be ready to consume that content. And as the website, you have to give me the correct content so I can actually see what I'm looking at. When I'm on my laptop, it's a completely different experience. Just show me the full site, I'll scroll around, I'll do whatever. So you have to understand how your people want that content from you and then adjust accordingly. We firmly recommend going to a responsive scenario moving forward. There are instances where you will want dedicated mobile domains. You have a specific landing page for a campaign, that's totally fine. But over time, you want to move away from it. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's definitely the case that responsive design is a great thing, uh, assuming it's done well and, and not, you don't mess up or anything like that, because it can encompass a wide variety of different devices. And there are a much larger variety of devices these days. You've got everything from TVs down to desktop, normal Googlebot, you've got tablets, which Googlebot basically kind of treats like desktop. You've got smartphones, you've got dumb phones. And if you remember that example from the Eiffel Tower, they were returning whack, you know, <coughs> really ancient kind of markup to Googlebot and pretending like we were a mobile phone. Uh, so we've got some good posts. Uh, Pierre Farr did a good post. I'll, I'll try to tweet a link to it uh, to talk about how to handle different types of mobile scenarios. If you do responsive design, I think that's fantastic. Um, Ajax and JavaScript normally works well, but if your entire site is JavaScript and really heavy, that can be a lot more difficult for websites to parse. Um, but if you look at the trend, it's clear that 10 years from now, we'll definitely want to have rich advices in our pocket and we'll be able to do more. So you'll have to adapt. You'll have to look and say, oh, I used to be able to do Flash. Now, if iPhone doesn't do Flash, maybe I can't find my Pinkberry if I'm you know, trying to access it on an iPhone. So I have to think about how to change my site. That, that's going to keep happening as the devices evolve. Matt, if I design my website for Google Glass, will you give me one? <laughs> 
Just my own. Um, yeah. That'll probably work once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's my last story. Oh, yeah, yeah. intermission. Funny Google last story. Oh, we'll get to later. Oh, we'll get to later. Um, Matt, Dwayne said social is number two on the level of importance for the Bing algorithm, and in fact, behind content, uh, ahead of, just behind content and ahead of links. How would you rank that same chart, which was content, social, user experience, link building, and then SEO? <laughs> I love uh, SEOs. I love yeah. SEOs because they just split that hair like 17 yeah, well, ways. Uh, can I clarify this? Sure. Okay, so, so meanwhile, give me the five categories again. Yeah. Yeah. Your so categories I'm are sure. content, social, user experience, link building, and SEO. Okay. Survey says. I just want to clarify this, right? Like, what I'm telling you is how you should be focusing as a business. What I'm not telling you is, this is the order our algorithm processes your website in. Okay, if I were going to do that, I would write out the algo, leave it on a post-it note, and it would be on the podium for you. So, so there you go. Yeah, that, that kind of reminded me of the Rodney Dangerfield movie that's like, uh, I only have one question in 27 parts. <laughs> oh, no, okay, I'm trying to take notes. Uh, certainly, I would actually kind of wrap content user experience into one because it, it is basically, you know, what does a user get? What is the value add? Often you'll hear Google talking about value. You know, if you have original content but it's not really useful, that's not that great. If you have great content but it's really hard to find or really annoying to use your site or your site is really slow, that's also not that great. So you want to maximize that experience. Once you have that, then the other things like link building and SEO and getting viral transmission on, on social, all that gets a lot easier. Um, so I, I've say, said before, long term, 10 years from now, I think social and identity are definitely going to matter a lot more. You know, if, if Danny leaves a comment on a forum, I want to be able to surface that no matter whether you know, it's, it's a tiny little forum or whether it's you know, right there on marketing land or search engine land. So we're going to be in a period where it's uncertain exactly how much weight different factors should be deserved, but there's a clear long term trend where as you know more about a person and as you can trust them more and as their reputation builds a little bit more, then that helps you say, okay, this is going to be a good resource. But short term, you know, we'll see how all that works out. I don't actually comment. I have bots that do that. <laughs> Danny Bot. Wait, are you the cheap jerseys online guy? I really like your blog. Oh, it's really nice. <laughs> um, I can take a social detour. I'm going to try to get you guys to answer, but I didn't think you answered. At least that again earlier this week. Um, links still heavier weight generally than social share, social signals. Yeah. In general. Yeah, yeah. The personal life results, and you both already said this, just to repeat it, you get to the personal life results, social can have a heavy influence. Heavier. <laughs> heavier influence, yeah. Um, unpersonalized stuff, what's going on? Google Plus, just yes or no, Matt, just I, yes or no, I does honestly, it count? I honestly don't know <laughs> the answer. I don't use incognito that much. I haven't delved into that side of that. But you don't know if, they, if, if having a lot of Google Pluses can help me do better or worse for her. I, I would hate to give a definitive yes no answer and then go back and find some corner of the team that, that we're okay. using it or that we're using it that I didn't know about. But Facebook doesn't matter because they don't We, we typically can't crawl Facebook because they typically are private stuff or you have to log in. So all the shares, all that stuff on Facebook, unless it's somewhere public where Googlebot can crawl, usually none of that has any impact whatsoever. Great, how about you? Social shares. Yeah, we, we do have those partnerships with you know Facebook, Quora, LinkedIn, Foursquare, and so on. Um, and so we do see that data. Um, ultimately, obviously, when you're logged in, you know, if it's relevant to you, then that can help influence how the ranking stacks up for you. Uh, when you're not logged in, though, we still see that data as an aggregate signal. And so if everybody absolutely loves you in Facebook, then that's a positive signal to us. And we may actually opt then to show that result higher in the search rankings. Um, is there anybody here who is unaware that the search engines are constantly experimenting with their serves? Yeah. It's, <laughs> Newsflash. Is anyone sarcastic? Around. Would you please raise your hand? You know, I mean, like, because I get this all the time, right? I get, you know, some SEO at, you know, fill in the blank brand name emails me and says, you know, God damn it, Dwayne, you know, we were ranking number three and we've been there for the last four months and my executive went online last night and we were at number seven. How do I explain this? And my response is invariably stop giving them ranking reports. Um, and you'll save yourself a lot of headache. You know, serves belong to us, we experiment. That could really screw you if people are just visualizing those rankings. Uh, the reality is keep an eye on your stats and your traffic and your revenue and the real metrics of the real world. 
that's the true, the, the true test. But that social signal pattern that's happening out there, it can have an influence even when people aren't logged in. Let's move to the update portion of our questions. Um, when's the next Penguin update? Uh, Ask Barry Schwartz if I was longer. Uh, are you asking about the next incremental update or the next major update? Oh, 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 oh. Uh, we no longer care if it's incremental. We just want to know is it 25 now or 26 now? If it's See, big 26, we don't care. So, so we, the way that we do algorithmic stuff is we get it ready, we send it out to the launch committee, the raiders look at it, they say yes, no. We have a launch meeting once a week, we debate whether it's good or not. Eventually, things do or don't get launched. Um, but we don't really worry about what to number it, what to call it. It's like that change, you know. And, and then well, but you guys have to worry about what to call it. And I understand. But, that. but you have told you have told us so far there have been at least three penguin updates. Yes. Which we don't know whether it was a big update or small update. We just assume that there yeah. were three updates, three right. releases of the penguin algorithm. Previous previous updates of penguin have been, you know, the first one was the largest, and then there have been incremental updates. Uh, we're working on the next generation. Of penguin. Okay. We don't have a burn here in available. <laughs> when is the next Panda update? <laughs> okay. Excellent um, relevancy, folks. Excellent relevancy. I really should have checked on this one right before I left. There is, uh, the next Panda update is going to the launch eval. Uh, as we speak. Uh, it, I don't think it went last, so maybe this Thursday, so you know, maybe Friday or the, or the Monday after that, give or take. Buckle up your Pandas. Um, <laughs> What is the next big update everybody will be talking about in 2013? You know, it's weird because it's hard to anticipate exactly what will and won't necessarily get attention. Um, we are continuing to iterate on hack sites. Uh, uh, there will be a new version of Penguin. Um, we've, got, we've got some, we've, there's a lot of stuff we're working on. How many of you, by the way, have actually been hit by an update? Be, be proud. How many of you have just come through these updates and not been a problem at all to you? How many don't really get the update and think I just don't want to raise your hand? <laughs> how many are like, there's no way I'm raising my hand either way? <laughs> how many of you worry about the updates even though they don't hit you? Just, okay. Does anyone lose sleep over updates? Because what, what I find, by the way, is, as we program sessions before, I find that most people at the conference, they're not hit by the updates. So, you know, I think that that's probably because they generally have good, good content. They're interested in them. But uh, most of them are here, but those that are can certainly see math and Dwayne afterwards. Speaking of which, Dwayne, are you planning on a penguin, panda, update thing? No, our, um, our approach to these things is a little bit different. We tend to pick a, um, we tend to pick a lower, um, it, we're not as high, high visibility when it comes to those updates, and they take a lot longer for us to roll out, right? We do an extensive amount of testing. Um, even after we've tested it, it becomes positive. We tend to sit on it for a while because we need to see it in action in parallel to the actual real-time results to see if there is some kind of ripple and roll-on effect that we haven't accounted for, right? That's that's a really high-priority thing for us. So we don't tend to put them out there, announce them, that kind of idea. I'm using rich snippets on my site. Google has been showing our review stars and information for over a year. Excellent. Bing is not showing them. Bogus. <laughs> <laughs> Is this a common issue? I don't know where that question came from. That's an awesome question. <laughs> Matt Katz. Anybody want to claim that question? Were you tweeting from your notepad? No, no. <laughs> My notebook does not have tweet capacity yet. We'll it's not a notebook, it's a Nexus 10, okay? <laughs> uh, so I honestly, um, uh, who, raise your hand. Don't be afraid. Okay, you're probably going to have to come see me because I'll, I would have the same question of the team is, why is it not showing up, right? Um, in theory, there shouldn't be anything blocking. Why can Expedia and other big sites get away with millions of doorway pages, like a page for every possible flight from X to Y, all for computer-generated junk? Is it just because they back fair search? Oh, no, the last part. I just threw that in. I just threw that last part in. So, uh, you let all the big people, all the big brands can do whatever they want, right, man? No. They the walk brands, all over you. They can't do whatever they want. So, uh, and in fact, it, it's kind of interesting because I mentioned earlier we look at things in terms of value add, right? So what is, what is the value? So it can be curation, it can be original content, research, something that no one else provides. It can be doing something faster, better, better UI. You know, all those sorts of things can be really useful. So I'd, I'd have to check out the Expedia example to see exactly what sort of stuff they're doing. But in general, 
it's kind of it's kind of funny that there is this perception that sometimes Google, you know, doesn't take action on big sites because we do take action on big sites, and uh, a lot of times the big sites don't talk about it, and we don't really feel a need to call people out specifically. So it was relatively rare that I actually showed an example that involved a big site this time, but. There's all kinds of stuff going on all the time with all kinds of websites, e-retailers, all sorts of stuff where we're sending them notices, trying to work to make sure that we return the right stuff for users but don't return auto-generated or whatever low quality or spam pages. Um, it's just you typically won't hear as much about it because they don't talk about it. Why is Google Map ranking different than Google Organic? And why does Google decide to use a cluster of bad data when businesses are sending Google authoritative data? So you know, you've, got, you've got people who are actually sending you data in maps. And this is true of shopping as well. They send you data, but then some of them like lie. But then you trust that. So no algorithm's going to be perfect, I wouldn't claim. I'm more than happy to get examples and take that back to the team. It is a different team than the web search team. Um, and you know, if you look at local and you look at maps, uh, over time, we've made a lot of progress, but you know, seven years ago, we really didn't have Street View. We didn't have that functionality, and so we've been working and iterating and, and trying to improve things all the time. Possibly integrating things uh, with Google Plus might involve that identity, that trust, to sort of spot the bad clusters. So that might be a way to, to help disentangle that. But you know, I, I, I've read from the early days of Maps when it was really wild, wild west. I think they've made progress. I think they'll continue to make progress. And if you guys have any specific data points or anecdotes you want to pass on, I'm more than happy to go and poke the team and pass this on as well. Um, the perennially favorite question. Uh, I work for a large company that operates in over 30 different countries, and each of the countries have their own top-level domains for those countries. Do we need to be worried about duplicate content across domains that are in the same language? You know, we have a UK site and an American site with the exact same content. One's using British language incorrectly, and the other one's using the American language, which you should use. And um, <laughs> I can say that because I live in a bilingual house. But um, um, bilingual being English and English. Yeah, exactly. Um, what's your take? Does this present a duplicate content issue for us? What would you do to make sure your content's in the same language? What would we do? Blah, blah, blah. You know this. You know, yeah. just give me the advice on what I deal with this stuff. Right. So that's no, not a, by the way, that's not a, I'm not making fun of your question. It just comes up all the time. Right. So they already know how to answer it before Maybe I have. Maybe it's it. But basically, uh, spammers, you saw the sort of stuff that spammers do, right? Spammers tend not to register 30 different domains and 30 different TLDs with the same brand because that takes a lot of money and it takes a lot of work and spammers tend to be lazy, right? So usually you're in a completely different space and we do a very good job of distinguishing, hey, these are all related to the same organization. We can tell that this is not duplicate content. Uh, if there's anything you can do, like even just rewriting the home page or, or changing the prices, making sure they're in the local currency, all that sort of stuff can help. There's also hreflang, uh, so I, I can tweet about that later too, but if you, if you have an XML sitemap, you can say, all of these pages are different alternate versions of each other in different languages. And that's a really nice way to just say, hey, this is the content if I'm you know, coming from France, this is the, speaking French, this is the content if I'm speaking <coughs> German, that sort of thing. Most excellent, Bill. <laughs> excellent. Yeah, the reality is it's the same kind of thing for us, right? Um, install the metal ang tag, give us clues, help us understand. Um, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, and ultimately, we do a reasonable job figuring that out anyhow, right? There will be other signals, even if you do nothing. There will be local area signals pointing to something. And then it's not a big leap for us to understand that the number that's on the page is in pound sterling as opposed to US dollars when all of the commenters are coming from an IP range that's in Bristol. I mean, those things are, you know, again, it's that totality of the internet view. Uh, but anything that you want to do that helps out, by all means, it will help us become more accurate. Um, the question's about hackings that happen where people try to put hidden links that boost up the page rank that you show in the Google toolbar, and then they try to sell things from the pages that look like they have high toolbar page rank. Have you fixed that bug? But let me take it more broadly. Are you just going to kill the toolbar? I mean, you only, the, tool, the Google toolbar is only available now for Internet Explorer because apparently Chrome isn't able to handle that. Sorry. No, no. I mean, you know, you, 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 it's only left for IE, right. and you know, it's not available for Chrome. Sorry, I'm being snarky, but you know, it's not available for Firefox. 
practically nobody seems to be using it, except for the people who want to use it to get values to then sell it. And then, of course, if they don't use it, they're just going to pull it off your API. So why do we even have this at this point anymore? So this is one of these things where everybody in the room can't believe that other people use the Google toolbar other than to check page rank, right? And yet, Not the toolbar, the page rank meter of the toolbar. No, I, I understand. Okay, sorry. You I understand. understand. But uh, it turns out real people actually do use it, to use the Google toolbar indicator to sort of say, oh, what's the page rank? Is this a reputable site? Um, it's it's kind of like everybody thinks every single link on the web is has a no follow on it, but if you look, it's actually a very small fraction of the web that has a no follow attribute on those links. So we're getting kind of a biased sample here. Um, but it is true that we don't have the Google toolbar for Firefox or for Chrome, and the latest version of Internet Explorer, IE 10, I think doesn't allow toolbars anymore. <laughs> so there, there will at some point be a natural end of life, I think, for the Google toolbar, but we don't feel any special driving urge right now to just go and, and shut the Google toolbar off because a lot of people still like it. But don't you think that if you just killed it, it would like overnight eliminate a lot of these via PR6, by I mean, I would love the lack of junk yeah, yeah. mail I get from that. Right, no, uh, <laughs> I get it too. Um, <laughs> I'm bored of mine. Yes, I would like to buy some of your PR6 links. <laughs> Tell me all about them. Well, you're probably not aware that links could help you rank better. Right, right. You know, yeah, you may not be aware of this. Um, so I, I think over time that will sort of naturally go away. It, you know, some people might want it to happen faster. Um, I, I personally wouldn't mind if it happened on the faster end of the spectrum, but I think it will happen on its own regardless. Does anybody want it to happen? Does anybody want PR to go away? I think we proud you want it. How do you like it? I want to keep it. They just don't answer questions. <laughs> Does anybody want to Anybody not it? know what we're talking about when we talk about the page rank leader? And Does anybody it's want okay. Okay, good. So. Does anybody want Bing to expose its similar data? Yes. Oh! oh. I see. I see. Wait a second. Wait a second. I thought, yeah, yeah I thought now we like it. I thought in Bing Webmaster Tools, there are five little indicators that say what you think of the site, right? Oh, yeah, no, that's different, right? So, okay. so. Page rank, Tell me all about static this. rank. <laughs> Can I have your pen? Yeah. Um, no, I just don't want to take notes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, uh, don't worry, that's not going to happen. Um, so we, we have static rank, right? And the rating is 1 to 65,000 and change. So we obviously have to kind of figure out what that translates to as a graph. Uh, but the reality is, you know, the main reason we don't expose that is because there's a little abuse that happens, <laughs> and people tend to look at that and say, ah, shortcut. So if I just go to a high PR site and I get something from them, I'm going to shortcut everything I need to do, and my user experience doesn't matter, and my quality of content doesn't matter, and so on, and they get down that rabbit hole, and you need to pull out of the rabbit hole. So that's part of the rationale behind why we're not exposing it, but I'm obviously um, majority of people put up their hands saying they do want to see that data. So now I'm going to go tell one of my engineers and he's going to be so pissed. <laughs> Bing ring. Coming soon. Uh, I don't know. Bank? <laughs> no, we don't want that. <laughs> Bank. Gates rank. I think like Gates rank. More appropriate. We're going to founder to founder. <laughs> Bill rank. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, we're in our last five minutes, therefore, we are going into lightning round. Uh, Not speedy. <laughs> <laughs> Advice for a large site with a lot of user-generated spam? Should we have faster ways to send it? Get some editors, get some contributors. If you've got a large site, you have a lot of people who are passionate, enlist some of them to help you out. Yeah. Or, or write some spam filters. It is doable. Engage those people, use CAPTCHAs, all of that stuff, right? I mean, you're not the first company to hit that wall, and there are solutions out there already. If you need to move to a new platform, better management, do it. It's worth it in the long run. All right, so Vic and Drocher, who submitted that question, get on that. Right <laughs> right. Um, now, uh, <laughs> two people understood that. Um, He's the head of Google Plus. <laughs> <laughs> not I sorry. think most people know that. Uh, we, know, we know you shouldn't use article submission sites anymore, but do they actually cause a penalty, or have those kinds of links just been devalued? Okay. So and then more broadly, you know, when, when, okay, okay, fine. So, so let's let's look down the drain, right? Lightning round. So you, you show up, <laughs> you use that piece of article content, 
It's a poor quality. It doesn't rank well. We already have an original source for it. You don't rank well. Your traffic goes down. Those are signals we look to to help understand your popularity. Your popularity is circling the drain. Why the hell would we ever show you in search results? There you go. If you're worried that something might be causing you issues, you can use the discipline. Um, what's with eliminating rank scraping with the threat of API access? Like you guys are like cracking down on people saying, if you, you know, these people are scraping our stuff and we don't want you to use their API or we're going to yeah. go after them. Yeah. So uh, way back like 10, 11, 12, 13 years ago, uh, I caught one spammer, one scraping package. It accounted for 4% of all the traffic to Google. Okay? And that was one scraping piece of software. It's pretty safe to assume that Google has to have thousands of extra machines to deal with all the scraping. So I, I think it's pretty legitimate for us to think about every few years, okay, what do we need to do to sort of minimize the scraping, minimize the, the, the abuse or the, the load on our server so that other regular people have slower search results. You know, and, and Dwayne was just saying, you know, people at some point need to get over ranking reports, right? And so just having those and feeding those is kind of like a safety blanket, so if we can move beyond that. Um, can you just unpack the whole negative SEO thing? I mean, it's someone someone's getting spam links pointed at us. How should we address this? And SEO, is that gonna, negative SEO, is that real? Does that kill me? We Why do you allow it? What's wrong with you? Arr. We try very hard to make sure that no one can hurt someone else. We've seen instances like with sex.com where somebody impersonated another guy and actually sent a fax in and claimed sex.com at the domain name registrar level. So it is possible to impersonate people and cause harm. So we don't say it's impossible, but we try really hard to make sure that you don't have to worry about what other people are doing. Nonetheless, if you are at all concerned, you can always look at your backlinks and webmaster tools and you can disavow any link that you're worried about or that you think might be causing you any, any kind of issue. So disavow is useful from that perspective as well as the primary reason, which is if you need to do cleanup of your own links that you've made yourself, you'll be able to. Yeah, and Matt touched on this earlier, right? I mean, those disavow tools, you can use those to block entire domains. Mm -hmm. Don't be bashful about that. I mean, you might be on the fence about looking at this thinking, well, maybe there are some good links, but if you know that there are some bad links, Dump the domain. I mean, chances are if there's a few bad links coming from it, it's not in error. So get rid of the whole thing, right? You've got others you can depend on. Most in most queries, in order to rank well for them, you need very few actual good quality links pointed at you. So it's not a scenario where you get thousands of links pointed at that URL, and if you give up that domain, which is pointed 1,200 links at you, you're going to plummet. The reality is, if that's the case, then you shouldn't have been ranked for it anyhow. And Use those tools, get rid of those problems for yourself. Uh, I have a huge site, half awesome, half crap. Um, <laughs> work on the half crap part. Do I need to worry about the crap part that's all machine curated, or will you guys just take care of that for uh, me? Uh, Do I hurt the whole thing? You might not want us to take care no, of that for yeah. you. <laughs> so consider doing a little curation yourself. Yeah, if you let the mathematics figure that out, <laughs> why not go so well? Uh, Every page on this site is 0.5 of what it should be. <laughs> So really, you should block the crap. Uh, or, or curate it, raise the value, find yeah. ways to block it. You know, there's lots of ways to deal with bad content. Decrapify it. Decrap. Target your optimization. Figure out what's important to your business, and then focus going down that stack. Because a lot of times, what you might find out is that half crap area is actually the bottom two thirds of the website. There's no value, and then you could legitimately cut the crap. <laughs> now, before anybody moves. Um, there's an evaluation there. Uh, if you actually hated us and tried to act, um, you know, maybe you could focus on the content. But aside from that, you know, all comments welcome. We definitely want it. Um, thanks especially to Matt who actually rehearsed. <laughs> oh, oh, by the way, uh, since we didn't take any live questions, oh. I have this wild stallion shirt left over. I think we'll have to give it to Rufus. What do you guys think? Oh my god, yes. Absolutely. I wanted to win it too. Um, in 10, 30 seconds from my story. Oh, we don't have 30 seconds. Oh, come on. You have really fast, 30 seconds. Okay. So, really fast. Uh, at South by Southwest, we had a couple of SUVs running around, people taking the big and on channel. Oh my god, you can't tell that story. Yes, I can. All right. <laughs> uh, a couple of girls hopped in wearing Google Glass. <laughs> and uh, they were all, you know, this is awesome, this is great, blah, blah, blah. People were asking them about it, they were doing the demo, and they were asked to take the big and on challenge, and they both came up as big. <laughs> Sorry.
The class was unable to... So, so did you guys hear that other story about for the Bing It On challenge? <laughs> the guy who actually won and they, they weren't ready for that and they refused to give him anything? It, it was on Hacker News. We could look it up. Oh, okay. Third prizes. <laughs> See? Uh, I, I call Sam. Yeah, I call Junk. Be excellent to each other. Anyway, um... <laughs> 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 